great battle that is about to begin here. By day's end, the Mediterranean will be flowing red with blood. At stake is nothing less than the future and independence of Greece, a country of islands and city-states which lie just outside the reach of the greatest empire in the known world, Persia. Persia was the world superpower of its day, enormously wealthy, enormously self-confident, the greatest multi-ethnic, multicultural empire the world had seen. A Persian invasion force of epic proportions is on the horizon. As many as 700 ships carrying 150,000 warriors determined to add Greece to their empire. But one Greek is poised and ready for battle. His name is Themistocles, an Athenian admiral and statesman who has been preparing for this moment for years. But going up against Persia, the world's greatest superpower of the time, would be no day at the beach for Themistocles. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. First of all, the Greek naval fleet was outnumbered two to one. Second of all, Themistocles faced the almost insurmountable problem of trying to unite a completely disparate and contentious group of warriors into one command. You see, the good news about the civic development of ancient Greece was the city-state. Each of these city-states was sort of a self-contained, self-reliant mini-country within Greece. But the bad news about the civic development of ancient Greece was the city-state. Because inasmuch as each of these city-states sort of spoke the same lingo, worshipped the same gods, there was really no sense of a national unity. And their only priority was their own particular regional and cultural agenda. At best, they didn't get along. At worst, they were violently at each other's throats. If there was someone who could pull the Athenians together, it was Themistocles a man who didn't come from the aristocratic ranks and wasn't ashamed to let his fellow Athenians know it. He was always an outsider. He saw himself as an outsider, and he uh, prided himself on his lack of polish. Uh, he said that he might not know how to tune a lyre uh, or to sing well, but he knew all you needed to know to make a city great and free. Themistocles was no stranger to facing the Persians in battle. Ten years earlier, a smaller Persian force had invaded Greece for the first time and fought the Athenians and her allies at Marathon. Now, Themistocles would bring that experience to Salamis and focus his strategy on a fatal flaw he detected in the Persian war machine, their navy. He understood that water was not the Persians' natural element. Persia was a land power. In fact, Persian religion considered salt water to be demonic. Themistocles wanted the Greeks to build a navy unlike any the world had ever seen. Immediately, work began at breakneck speed to build a fleet of 200 triremes, the deadliest ship in the ancient world. Trireme's about 130 feet long. It's light and sleek, and it's tipped with a wooden ram covered in bronze at the water level, and that is the offensive weapon of the trireme. I think of the trireme actually as a guided missile. The trireme consisted of 170 rowers on three separate levels, 62 on the top level, 54 in the middle, and 54 on the bottom. On the lowest level, rowers were seated so deep in the ship that their oar ports were just 18 inches above the water line. So you have a ship, a wooden ship, that is powered from the oars. It can go up to eight knots, but nine knots, which is an amazing speed for the ancient world. And it can attack like a missile. And the rowers, of course, have to learn how to work as a team. They have to learn to row together in unison, which is an easy thing to begin to do, but a very difficult thing to master. The Mysticles fleet of triremes was finished in just a few years and in the nick of time. In the spring of 480 BC, Persia launched a massive invasion of Greece. The Mysticles knew that the Persian fleet outnumbered the combined Greek fleet by almost two to one so he devised a simple yet cunning plan to keep the Greeks together and level the odds. 
he had to turn a disadvantage into an advantage, the fact that he had fewer ships than the Persians. So he had to lure the Persians, if you like, into such a battleground that they could not advance the whole ranks. So he can actually concentrate their power and strike it. So the best place that he could do that was at the Straits of Salamis. Themistocles would devise a ruse to lure the Persian fleet into the narrow Straits of Salamis. Themistocles was a very cunning man, a great trickster. Themistocles knew that the Persians preferred to win battles through diplomacy, through intimidation, and through buying traders. On the eve of the battle, Themistocles sent a trusted servant across the straits to the Persian camp. The servant played the role of a traitor, telling the Persian king the Greeks were in disarray, and if the Persians sent their ships in the night, they could surprise the Greek navy in the morning. The Persians took the bait. And so at dawn, the Persians discovered to their shock that the Greek fleet, instead of being about to flee, was getting into battle formation, and that they, the Persians, would have to fight. So it was a perfect setup of a battle by Themistocles. Now 200 triremes, powered by 34,000 Greek rowers, formed into a line. There was no room for the Persians to maneuver in the narrow straits. Themistocles had sprung the perfect trap. The attacks raged all day long as the Greek triremes encircled the Persian ships, then pounded them with their forward rams. And the Persian officers died in unusually high proportions. The battle was so confused, chaotic, and unnerving that at the end of the day, the Greeks weren't even sure that they had won. But thousands of lifeless enemy bodies on the shores of Salamis revealed a decisive Greek victory. Some historical sources claim the Persians lost as many as 200 ships to the Greeks' 40. Any Persians that didn't drown were slaughtered by Greek soldiers waiting on shore. Had the Greeks not won the Battle of Salamis, the Greek civilization or ancient Greece is values that we all share to, in our today's world may never have been there. After the stunning victory at Salamis, Themistocles was hailed as a hero, but his personal ambitions and greed began to add to his many political enemies. It was only a matter of time before the rage of the assembly boiled over. Athens at this time had a practice called ostracism, an annual unpopularity contest in which the people would vote for the politician who they felt was most disruptive, most dangerous to the political process, and they would exile him for 10 years. In 471 BC, Themistocles was ostracized. In a stunning irony, he was forced to embrace the enemy he had fought so hard to defeat. He would never see Athens again. Amazingly, he was forced to flee to Persia itself, where he found refuge, and he ended his life speaking Persian, working as an administrator for the Persian king, helping the Persians govern Western Asia Minor. Themistocles had played his part in an epic story of Greek power and achievement that looked to a glorious past for inspiration. The legendary tales of the gods and heroes told in epics like the Iliad and the Odyssey. The stories may be myth, but the engineering achievements of these Greek ancestors were very real and still stand today. In the Greek city-state of Sparta, boys began their military training at age seven. By 1300 BC, a people speaking an early form of the Greek language had inhabited large portions of mainland Greece. They were known as the Mycenaeans, and for years their wars and scandals, exploits and achievements became the stuff of legend and laid the foundation of Greek civilization. Their capital city of Mycenae was surrounded by a massive citadel built over the course of 150 years. According to myth, 
It was from this city that the Mycenaeans were led by a king named Agamemnon, whose epic struggles were written down by the 8th century BC poet Homer in two of history's most famous tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the Iliad was something like the Bible for ancient Greeks. It contained a moral story. It told you how you should live. It described gods, it described religion, but also described people, it described situations. It gave ideals that you should look upon. The tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey have become some of the most famous in history. The abduction of Helen by Paris, Agamemnon's 10-year siege of Troy, and the giant wooden horse which the Greeks used to enter Troy and destroy the city. Although Agamemnon's exploits during the Trojan War may have been heroic, his return home to Mycenae was far from a hero's welcome. He was murdered by his own wife. Scholars have debated for centuries whether or not Homer actually penned the Iliad and the Odyssey, or whether he just collected the folk tales of song, or whether he had anything to do with them at all. But if the ancient Greeks came back today, they'd scoff at this pithy harangue. Because of the ancient Greeks, Homer wasn't just some top 40s folk singer, nor was he the best-selling hack writer of some piece of pulp fiction. Homer was an historian. And these legends weren't the bedtime stories to be whispered to the kitties before the oil lamps were blown out. These were accountable facts. This is what is left of Mycenae, the capital city of which Homer writes and where many, including me, would like to believe that Agamemnon really ruled. These ruins show us that not only were these early Greeks master builders, but they were capable of some amazing engineering feats. As you approach Mycenae, first thing, of course, that you will see is the fortification walls, which are very impressive. And immediately you have this feeling of awesome. The citadel walls of Mycenae are buttressed by stone blocks which weigh up to 10 tons apiece. They were engineered with such precision that each stone fit perfectly in place to its adjacent block. But for awe-inspiring visuals, nothing in Mycenae comes closer than the colossal main entrance to the citadel, the Lion's Gate. This is the Lion's Gate, the main gate to the citadel of Mycenae. It is one of the most stunning structures of all of early antiquity. It is an imposing piece of symbolism. It is an imposing piece of engineering. Two lions standing fully upright, their paws on the base of a column. Their heads, which are missing, will be turning outward. Anybody approaching this gate would know that Mycenae stood for one thing, power. Structurally, the gate looks to be a standard engineering practice of post and lintel construction. These vertical elements here, these massive piers, are the posts supporting the lintel, the horizontal element, which weighs about 12 tons. But it is above the gate where the lions live that the engineers took it one step further. If you look at this triangle of indented stones right by the lions, it develops an element that we call the corbelled arch. Suppose you have these four stones, and instead of piling them up, you try to create an opening from the outside and you steal a little bit of space by putting them this way. This is cobbling. If we are a little bit more ambitious because this is not sufficiently large and we try to displace further these stones, still in cobbling, then we are running this risk that this is falling down. So what is the little trick? It's simple. You start putting counter weight behind each of these corbelled stones. Now, this triangle